having us today. Uh, myself and the ATCHAC team would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Nguyen Chak people. I pay my respects to elders past and present. This land always was and always will be Aboriginal. My name is Christy Harper and I'm the manager of ATCHAT and I'm here today with Clint and Danielle uh, to talk to you about the Assistive Technology Media Mentoring Program. So like it says on the screen, our chat is a peer-led, co-designed community for assistive technology users to share information and lived experience about assistive technology. Our objective, also on the screen, is to increase capability and confidence of people with disability to make AT decisions through peer support and peer-led information. We achieve this objective through two streams. Our peer-led information products that show people using assistive technology to live, play and work. And then also through our peer support initiatives, where we provide a space for people with disability to seek um, and offer support to each other. Uh, our peer-led uh, information stream involves peer-led content, often in a video format, about AT that our community finds accessible, interesting and informative. We work really hard to make sure our content is about how people use assistive technology to live, play and work, and not a motivational piece about somebody's disability. Um, if you'd like to access any of our videos, you can find them on our website, which is at chat.com.au. Within our peer support stream, we have Chatterbox and also the assistive technology peer mentoring program that we're talking about today. So Chatterbox is a Facebook group and it's open exclusively to people who use assistive technology and it provides a safe and supportive space for people to ask questions and share information and chat to each other. Our assistive technology peer mentoring program um, provides people with peer-based personalised AT solutions that support their goal setting and enable decision making in regards to assistive technology. So how did we create a model about AT peer mentoring? Well, we started with and continue with co-design practices. There's a fair bit of complexity and risk associated with peer mentoring in relation to assistive technology. Um, and so we also worked closely with our research partner, Natasha Layton, who was at Swinburne University at the time, to develop a service delivery framework with the highest clinical governance and risk management. The poster on the screen is just a bit of a summary of the different methodologies we used to ensure we were working with people within our community to create a program that best met their needs. On the screen there's a timeline and it goes through the exploration, experimentation and evaluation and then finishes with the launch of our pilot program. Um, if you want more details about our co-design methodologies or the research we undertook is available on our website. So the model we developed with our community is simple and effective and it has three stages. So it's presented on the screen where I have three interlocking puzzle pieces that create a circle with a single heading in each, connect, create and control. As part of today's presentation, I'm going to ask Danielle and Clint some questions about their experience with the program, referencing each stage of the model. Before I do that, I think it's just worth noting that uh, we launched the At Chat pilot just before COVID lockdown in WA. Um, we set up the program to ensure that the delivery was available online um, and via virtual channels because our community had told us that was their preferred method of um, delivery. Um, so it meant we were ready to go come lockdown, but we did move everything to online. Okay, so before we move on, let me introduce uh, Clint and Danielle. So Clint is here today um, with us because he worked with our chat as an ATPM mentor during the pilot. Clint is motivated to find solutions for himself and others he meets along his journey as he transitions to his life as a person with paraplegia. As a peer mentor, Clint undertook person-centred training with our team and participated in supervision with our occupational therapist. And this is Danielle Meacham. And she participated in the pilot as a mentee, working with Clint to address some of her AT goals. 
Uh, Danielle has a lifelong physical disability which regularly requires some creative thinking to make things more accessible. She strongly believes the right assistive technology can enable people to dream of possibilities, meet their potential and promote full community inclusion. Our program is designed for anyone who has a query about assistive technology and would like to explore different AT solutions with someone who has lived experience to share. It's also worth noting that the mentors and mentees are not matched for disability or for the AT they use. That would just not be a possibility. Um, we do consider, however, in the match, accessibility requirements and preferred methods of communication. All right, so the connect part of the model. The connect part is about forming a working relationship. It's about getting to know each other. And the aim of this section is to confirm the goal, the 80 goals the couple are going to work on together. That's all right, perfect timing. Just about to ask you a question. <laughs> so, Danielle, what was it like to work with uh, Clint, and how did you develop a relationship? It was really great. I found it um, really relaxed, and it was more um, like friends problem solving rather than an imbalance of power. Um, we basically just initially chatted about our disabilities and our professional backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and what were the key benefits of discussing your goals with Clint through that peer-to-peer -peer lens? As I like, sort of hinted before, um, probably the thing that I liked about the most was that it did have the power imbalance that sometimes can happen with allied health professionals. Um, then sometimes it's just like a, a, this is a way things should be done um, and it doesn't necessarily always give um, me as a person with disability um, all the control or some of the control. Um, I also found it really great. It was a really cost effective um, way of exploring AT that I didn't necessarily understand all the ins and outs of. Yeah. Um, great. Um, and Clint, how did you go building your relationship with Danielle? Connecting with Danielle, um, as Christy mentioned, we've just we've pretty much gone into lockdown. Um, so, obviously, as you're aware, those people with some sort of disability or any sort of condition um, didn't want to stay away. So, uh, after a ticket was lodged, I sent her a message and said, Hey, here you've got a problem. And we set up a phone call where I just had a brief conversation, as Danielle mentioned about our disabilities, who we are, introduced myself, and said, I'm sure I can help you out with um, something that. You need so it was it was quite easy and a relaxed conversation to begin with. Right, and how did your lived experience work as an asset for you? Um, I, I guess I, I broke my back four years ago and spent three months in hospital, so I had a lot of time to research the things that I wanted to do. And from previous jobs, I had a good knowledge um, of of the activities that people with a disability do. Um, IT and things like that, so mobility devices. So I use that um, to better my knowledge and then pass that information on to, to other people. Great, all right, so the next part of the model is create, um, and this is where the pair create their AT solution together. So before we go any further, I think it's worth asking Danielle, what was the goal that you and Clint decided to work on? So it's perfect timing, really. Um, we were exploring at the beginning of COVID. I've been trying to look for solutions for my smoke alarm. Um, it would go off all the time, like multiple times a week whenever we um, So I got into the habit of avoiding cooking, even toast, uh, as there was somebody else home, um, to, to turn the alarm off when it went. Um, my flatmate moved out because of my COVID risk, and I had no more support workers coming into the house. So I was in a difficult position where our solution was to pull the battery out of the alarm, um, which obviously is a great from a safety perspective. Um, so I've been looking around at options and I couldn't find anything that was hardwired to meet safety standards in Australia. Um, the only thing I could find was to have it rewired for a switch that was lower on the wall that was going to be really cumbersome, it was also going to be really expensive. And, I thought we would smart technology around these kinds of things, so I should like to confirm that. Alright, great. Um, and so, Clint, 
We know Danielle's issue that she was faced with in terms of her smoke alarm. What was your process here? How did you explore and compare some AT solutions that Danielle could look into? Through the background in um, IT and security, I knew there were um, some hardwired options. Um, again, a little bit cumbersome, a little bit more expensive. So we initially spoke about how about we use a broomstick, take the batteries out, which isn't the best idea. Um, and things like that. So obviously developed from there, understanding Danielle's um, ability and what she could do, I tailored a solution to, to best suit, which was um, more along the home automation side of the voice control of the switch. So that background helped me narrow that list down myself. I didn't have to start from scratch or just offer one solution. Yeah, great. And Danielle, during this create stage while working with Clint, how were you involved or how did Clint support your AT decision making? Clint gave me a variety of different options um, and information and background around. So I was in a sort of going in and out of research on whatever worked for me best. Um, Clint also offered to do follow up with any questions that I had and any further support that I might need. Yeah, great. Alright, and then the final step in our model is control. So the control section is about making a decision and a purchase. Um, the mentee, or in this case Danielle, is in control here. And she can seek support from Clint if she needs it. Um, so Danielle, talk us through the control stage of your peer mentoring journey. Um, following your session with Clint, how did you go about purchasing your AT? Two other mentees that I had, one was um, just after more information um, about driving a vehicle after a recent disability, going through that process, and I had another one that was in Queensland um, that asked for um, an attachment to be fitted to the vehicle so that they could carry a mobility device on the back. After researching that a little bit more, I found that um, road regulations and vehicle modifications came into play, 
So the, the option that, that best fit, that they'd like, wasn't actually legal for the size of the vehicle that she had. So I had to look into it a little bit further and um, look at a, a slightly different alternative. Um, and then that involved OT reports and then um, more reports for funding to be released through the NDIS. So I guess my part of the control stage there was handing all that information back over to the mentee who then passed it on to um, their OT to, to investigate that further. Yeah, great. Thanks, Vince. That's a really important point. What we're doing here is not about replacing the role of an allied health professional in any way. It's about creating a team of people that are enabling decisions in relation to assistive technology. So that's a great way to demonstrate that through the three you worked with, there was all different um, different requirements in there. Um, and so uh, I guess what was the same about the mentoring process across all of your mentees? Um, I guess at, at the end of the, the program, we were asked to summarise and, um, and send our reviews and a bit of reporting. And I'm going to read back what I wrote because it's actually true and I'm probably not going to remember it the same way as I wrote it, so I do apologise for that. But this is what I wrote. The program has been designed around, around finding a mentor that has the lived experience and adaptability to engage with people on multiple levels, regardless of their disability or the AT they use. It's about sharing a lived experience around the process of deciding what AT will work best, not having used the exact same AT as someone. So despite where a person is in their journey, the process is the same. You want to get to know the person, what their goals, and find out what will work best for them and their needs. It's about fitting the AT solution to the person as best as possible, rather than trying to make a person fit the AT solution. Awesome, thanks so much for that, Claire. Um, Alright, so before I hand over to some questions from the audience, I'd just like to let you know our chat's next steps, moving forward with the peer mentoring program. Um, it's really worth noting that the pilot was a major part of our co-design processes, so now we need to respond on our findings. Um, the next iteration of the AT Peer Mentoring Program will be re renamed the AT Navigation Program, uh, with peer mentors taking on the newly titled role of AT Navigator. This is to reflect a more peer-focused and support-based and equal relationship between the AT user and the AT Navigator that maybe didn't exist in the words mentor and mentee. Um, also, responding to our pilot feedback, we've invested in a learning management system and an e-learning specialist has joined our team to create training back packages about assistive technology and assistive technology decision making for our AT navigators as part of their training, for our um, customers, and then also for the community uh, more broadly. So if you'd like to know um, any more about us or our research or our co-design, please visit our website or come and see myself. Gail is our team member at the back and also Neil. Um, I would be happy to speak to you over the next few days.